Well, hey, friends, and welcome to Wednesday Chapel. What a blessing is it to be able to worship with everyone right now? What a blessing is it that we're able to wake up um, and talk to God? For his mercies are new every morning. So we are so thankful to be here, even though it's asynchronously, even though we're not all watching at the same time, not all worshiping at the same time. We are all here to share in this moment together, and that is such a blessing and such a mercy from God. We're about to sing Amazing Grace, but beforehand, I'm going to lead us in saying the Lord's Prayer from Luke 11, um, where Christ teaches us exactly how to pray. If you know this, please say it along with me in your own native language. If you don't, that's okay. Listen, close your eyes, and hear the words of the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the glory, the power, forever. Amen. Be with us in this time, God. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first
that you're pleasing that I'm, oh, I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. Oh, it's who you are. Yes, it's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Yes, it's who I am. Oh, it's who I am. See, I've seen. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide. But I know we're all searching for answers.
without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains and my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes I'm a prisoner no rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life began oh, it's your grace so free washes up Take 
take this life and breathe schedule every part of ourselves every conversation lord every word that comes out of our mouth we give it to you father father a life with you requires death that may sound weird but a life with you requires death of our old selves may we lay to rest the the tendencies and the habits that we carry as as humans as, as broken humans lord and may we instead pick up that that light yoke and follow you May we give all of ourselves to you, Jesus. There's so much power in that. We just sung about how you're a good father and how therefore we want to give it all to you. You arrested death. <laughs> you are so powerful and so good and worthy of every ounce of the praise that we could ever give you. I thank you for that reminder. I thank you for your goodness. We love you so much, Father. We thank you for a time just to engage and connect with you. And may these uh, words in this sermon, Lord, uh, may they be received well. Uh, we just love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for your goodness. In your heavenly name, amen. Well, welcome back to chapels. I uh, hope that you are having a great day, a great week. And uh, uh, I can't believe we're already in October. And today we will continue in our series in the University Passage, studying Romans chapter 12. And uh, we have a great privilege of hearing uh, from one of my friends and the Director of Faith Integration here at APU, Dr. Paul Kack, who will share with us a little bit more about Romans chapter 12. So I hope you enjoyed today's message and help me welcome Dr. Paul Kack. Well, thank you, Pastor Koba, and to the Spiritual Life team for the opportunity to be here today. You know... I was thinking, um, actually, Koba, thinking about you, and I think I, I, I might write you in on my presidential ballot this year, uh, looking for some good alternatives, seriously thinking about that as an opportunity. We have a great team, don't we? Our spiritual life folks, as they continue to lead us, even from afar, and I'm grateful to be a part of that with you today. Uh, today, I get to talk about an area of, of personal and professional passion. Uh, I get to spend some time thinking with you about the vital importance for Christians to grow and be equipped with the mind of Christ. Uh, I want to contemplate together with you uh, what is going on as we think and as we learn to think in deeply Christian ways, which is what we do here at this very special place called Azusa Pacific University. Uh, as a university, we look a lot like any school that you might choose. But as a Christian university, we have a higher calling than merely downloading content or giving tests 
assigning research papers, or giving you opportunity to practice important skills. Our aim, much as I think you'd expect from any Christian university, is to equip you to desire and to develop the mind of Christ. While you're here, we hope to give you opportunities to practice thinking Christianly about what you're studying so that when you leave, habits will have been formed. And and as a result, you're going to think and then as a result of that, act and live and work in this world in distinctly Christian ways. Our passage today, part of the year's university passage, comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what the good and pleasing and complete will of God is. Now, in order to talk through this passage with you, I want to, along the way, in giving you some suggestions, introduce you to four amazing people, four people who model this renewal of the mind. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a bishop named Jan a college student named Martin, a prolific author and international leader named Stanley, and a low-caste Indian teacher named Savra Tribai. All of these people thought as citizens of the kingdom of light, and then they applied the light of God's truth to their life and to the work that they were called to do in the world. Let's start by talking about Jan. Jan Amos Cominius was a bishop among the Moravian Brethren community. He was a native of the Czech Republic, and there he lived much of his life, but not his whole life, because he lived during the terrible time of the, of the Thirty Years' War, and he was so often on the run, sometimes within his own country, but sometimes in neighboring nations. It's amazing that this man made such an impact on the world the way he did, particularly in the field of education in light of the hardships that he faced. Once when he was a young pastor in his hometown and soldiers approached, he was in grave danger and he was forced to flee. With no time to spare, Cominius left behind his pregnant wife and his small son. It was not until years later that Cominius learned that his wife and son and their newborn baby had died of the black plague that had been brought to town by those soldiers. One writer says he was continuously faced with the abysses of human cruelty fanaticism, and the imperialistic struggle for power, yet he believed in the final victory of the way of light and in the possibility that all could and should be educated in that way. Which brings us to Comenius's greatest contribution. You see, he lived in a time when schooling was made available only to rich and privileged young men. Girls and children of peasants need not apply. They were not welcome. But because Comenius' mind was willingly captive to Christ and to the Christian faith, he knew this was unacceptable. He knew that this did not reflect the good and the pleasing will of God. Because of his Christian convictions, Comenius believed in what he called universal education, which for him meant two things. First, schooling was for everyone. And secondly, we should study everything. Listen to his words from the great didactic. This is one of his books uh, of many, but most of his books, most of the manuscripts of his writings uh, perished in a fire when people burned down his house, another one of his tragedies. Listen to what he says about schooling for everyone. Not only the children of the rich and noble, but all children ought to be educated in the same way, whether they are rich or poor, boys or girls, or whether they come from cities or villages. God has chosen the most perfect tools of his glory out of the poorest, humblest, and unknown people. There is no sufficient reason why the female sex should be excluded from studying, for also girls are images of God. They participate in his grace and in the kingdom of God, and they are equipped with the same industriousness and capacity for wisdom. Now listen to his words again, again from the great didactic, this time related to the study of everything. Comenius says, the natural demands upon humans are that first, they understand all things. Second, that they can rule over all things and themselves. And third, that they and all things be rightly related to God as the source. Under this systematic education, Comenius says, has to be the reverence through which the human mind leans toward and connects itself with the supreme being. You see that? His understanding was that as we study everything, it should cause us to see the connections that all 
we and everything have to God. Comenius had a faith-informed understanding. It led him to rethink practically everything about who schooling was for and what schooling was meant to do. And I say, wow, that he could do that in such deep and thoughtful ways during his time facing the challenges that he did. But, but why? Why did Comenius do this? Because like APU as a Christian university, Jan Amos Comenius was invested in the instruction of our passage today from Romans chapter 12. Listen to the New Living Translation. The Apostle Paul says to the Christians in Rome, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will, which is good and pleasing and complete. Here's the NIV translation. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I'd like to take some time in the passage and, and talk through the big ideas there. And, and then to following that, give you some application and introduce you to a few more people. First, in the passage, Paul gives a clear-cut and unconditional directive. Do not be conformed to this world. You see, the Roman Christians to whom he first wrote were surrounded by myriad religions and myth-based worldviews, philosophical uh, schools of thought and temptations of the rich and famous. Paul says to them and to us in our own context, intellectually, you must guard yourself from becoming vulnerable to the patterns that characterize this age. Before you know it, he says to them and to us, these patterns will ever so subtly clone you into their mold from the outside in. As a result, your thoughts and behaviors will be more or less indistinguishable from the pernicious patterns that you've allowed to form you. And, and, and Paul then offers this exhortation, and I'm going to contemporize this for our own context. Hang with me here, right? But Paul says, take action. The world's ways are peddled by angling reporters, political representatives, and biased researchers. They're found in church, on talk radio, and in school textbooks. They make a smile, laugh, and even like blog posts, Instagram feeds, and a multitude of clever memes. <laughs> now, hold on. Wait a minute. I am by no means condemning every expression of any of these sources of knowledge. Much good can be found in credible research and in social media, in news outlets, in church, and yes, even in school textbooks. APU has programs that are aiming to provide a better way to think about journalism and marketing and graphic design and more. The question is, can you tell the difference between those that reflect the patterns of this world and those that re reflect the kingdom of light? And can you, when the opportunity warrants, can you creatively combine the best of both those worlds into new and innovative thoughts for the world in which we live in today? What Paul wants the Roman Christians to do, and for you and I to do instead, is to be transformed from the inside out. That word transformed is only used three other times in the New Testament, once by Paul, again in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and then twice by Matthew and Mark in the transfiguration story that they tell. Think about what's happening there. Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and up on the mountain they watched a conversation between Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Jesus' three friends watched as mind-bogglingly he underwent a noticeable physical change. But even though he changed, he was still recognizable. He was not malformed, deformed, unformed, or reformed. He was transformed. In Romans 12, the transformation or metamorphosis calls for uh, uh, called for a different kind of transformation than Jesus' transfiguration, but yet it was similar in effect. Let me explain. When you allow the wisdom of God's kingdom of light to reshape you from the inside out, you remain recognizably you. Same look and personality type, same hobbies and strengths, same favorite donut from Donut Man at 2 a.m., but now you're guided by a different mindset and you will more completely and competently represent the truths of God in the world. The mandate is clear, be 
transformed. And thankfully, Paul gives us a means by which to do this. He says, be by the renewing of your mind. That's how you go about this transformation process. So, so what does that mean? Well, think of it this way. You and I are in need of a fixer-upper of the mind. See, there's a need to admit, first of all, that something needs to be changed. There's need for improvement, need for renovation, and that someone with certain knowledge and abilities can help make that change. There's going to be some demolition work to make that happen. There's going to be a need to imagine new ways, better ways to use the space to make it more functional, more life-giving, more pleasant. And things are going to change. And it's going to be hard work and there will be cost. But that renewal is going to be so worth it for the people who live there and for the people who visit. We've been given a mandate and the means to fix fix up this house, right? This house, which is the home of ideas, concepts, viewpoints, worldviews, beliefs. Beliefs that need a critical look and possible reconstruction. This house needs to be furnished with the tools for right thinking. And the shelves need to be stacked with knowledge of those areas of focus that you're studying. And general knowledge. And knowledge informed by the Christian faith. So let's take a look at what that looks like, what that's like as we live that out together at APU. And here along the way, I'll introduce you again to some of these people that I've mentioned. Now, APU has been in my peripheral vision for almost my whole life. I've been working here as a member of this community for 15 years and very much love the opportunity to serve you and my colleagues here. In the 90s, I was a pastor at a church not far from here, and many of those who attended the church were APU students and employees. They called me the professor pastor, I think for a couple of reasons. One, I probably talked a little longer than I should have, which I'll try not to do today, and because when I'd preach from the Bible, I'd like to also bring in uh, other topics and themes from other areas of study and to, to help make those integrative connections. If I take you back much further, to the late 60s, I lived with my family in Glendora, and my older sister's first apartment was just around the corner from what was then known as Azusa Pacific College. Take a look at APC's slogan at the time. Academic excellence in a Christian environment. And and that's good, right? And And we still are committed to doing that. But I want you to also see how things have changed in terms of how we think about our identity. Our mission statement talks about how we are a community of disciples and scholars. And it's not that you are the disciples and we professors are the scholars. We're we're both both. We're trying to bring that together. And the way President Fergus is, is challenging us to think about this is to be a community of disciples and scholars pursuing what he calls Christ centered academic excellence. Notice, it's not just a Christian environment but an academic experience in which Christ is central. What you learn, the things that you're studying, should have Christ at the center of them. Okay, well, then how do we live into that? Here's my three suggestions. Three ways, practical ways, that you as a college student could go about living into this challenge to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'll mention these three people to you. First of all, Join the faculty in bringing the learning of the world, right? You're studying a lot of that as you come from one class to another, and the wisdom of the Christian faith into dialogue so that each can be better understood in light of the other. So let me introduce you to this second disciple scholar, Stanley, E. Stanley Jones. He was an American missionary, very well respected in both the U.S. and in his adopted home of India. Through the course of his life, this man wrote a gazillion books and spoke all over the world. He was extensive in people who knew him and appreciated the testimony of his faith. Let me read to you a little bit from his autobiography, where he talks about the connection between our Christ-centered approach and the approach of other academic disciplines. Here's how he puts it. There are two great approaches to life, he says, the Christian and the scientific. Since Christ is our revelation of what God is and man may become, the Christian approach works from Christ down. 
The scientific approach works from the facts up and out to conclusions. Do these two approaches come out to two viewpoints about life or one? Is the God of grace and the God of nature two gods or one? We Christians do not apologize for working from Christ down to life. What we see of the actual God in Christ and possible man in Christ makes us tingle with joy and excitement. But what about the scientific approach? Is it leading away from the Christian verdict on life? My conviction, Jones goes on, is that as the Christian approach becomes more Christian and as the scientific approach more scientific, they are coming out at the same place at the feet of Jesus. A great surgeon said to me one day, I've discovered the kingdom of God at the end of my scalpel. It's in the tissues. The right thing morally, said the surgeon, the Christian thing is always the healthy thing physically. I said to him, okay, please, please say that again. For if what you say is true, then morality is not merely in the Bible. It's in our blood, our nerves, our tissues. It is written within us. It's inescapable because you can't jump out of your skin. As if announcing a scientific discovery, he said, the Christian way is written in us. I quoted this, says Jones, before an audience, and at the close, a leading economist said, I'd like to put it this way. The right thing morally, the Christian thing, is always the healthy thing economically. I replied, then there is a way to get along with material things, and that is Christ's way? He gave an unqualified yes. Again, I quoted the surgeon's statement, and a leading sociologist said, I'd like to put it this way. The right thing morally, the Christian thing, is always the healthy thing sociologically. Jones, after reciting these and other stories, recounts clear from the international, down through the sociological, on into the economic, to the physical, on into the moral and spiritual, all up and down the whole gamut of life, the right thing morally, the Christian thing, is always the healthy thing. And I believe that no matter what class you might encounter in your APU education, there are versions of this that are worth exploring with your faculty. Secondly, develop a theological lens by which the will and ways of God become your go-to framework for evaluating all that you learn intellectually. Your theology and Bible classes are going to help with this, but you're going to get this in another way in the context of, of classes that aren't theologically focused but will provide some faith-based perspectives. So let's talk about a college student working on a bachelor's in sociology at Morehouse College and later a a bachelor's in divinity at Crozer Seminary. This young man's name was Martin. Young Martin had no idea of the work that he'd become known for, the cause for which he'd be given a Nobel Prize, or the idea that his life would be taken just as his influence was hitting its peak. What he did know is that he was a college student. His work, his calling at that time, was to go as deep as he could as a learner. And learn he did. Martin set to work reading and learning about important sociological theories, research methods, and best practices. He was well aware of and kept in mind the difficult issues of his day, the issues that he expected to inherit as he left school and went off into the world. But as a student, he also immersed himself in Christian perspectives on relevant issues such as justice, morality, and social change. Under the care of his instructors, Martin connected his studies in sociology to the wisdom of Scripture and to the work of influential Christians, both ancient and modern. One book that he read was this one. It was written by one E. Stanley Jones in commemoration of his friend Mahatma Gandhi, who, on the day that Gandhi died, Jones was on his way to visit. MLK would later say of this book that it clinched his decision to work non-violently for civil rights in the United States. Next to one passage in the book, uh, Jones uh, heard that, that King had written the words, this is it, right? It clicked for him. Do you, do you see what's going on here? The careful Christian thinking on the part of one man, Jones, about the thoughts of his friend, a Hindu man, Gandhi, were instrumental in opening up the mind of yet another Christian leader, King. And that thinking... That integrated Christian perspective changed the way that you and me and so many of us think about the work of racial reconciliation and justice. Third, 
as your renewed mind directs your transformation, be sure your body follows, guiding you to incorporate this faith-informed learning into a faith-filled way of life. I want you to remember now verse 1 in Romans 12. One of the things it says there is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, in one way, as you renew your mind, then you've got to train your mouth and your fingers and your eyes and your ears to act in accordance with the new ways that you understand things in, for example, the wonderful world of kinesiology or commercial music or public relations. So let me tell you about one more person who was willing to be this kind of living sacrifice. Her name is Savitribai Fuli. She's from the country of India. I have her here with Comenius because they are like twin brother and sister. Uh, they were born centuries apart in, in nations and cultures as different as you could possibly imagine. But because their minds, renewed by the mind of Christ, were transformed, their understanding of learning and education is remarkably similar. Savitribai was raised in uh, India at age, up to age nine in the low caste Shudra community. At age nine, she was, as is typical, married off to a, a young man, a 13-year-old young man in her, in her own caste, uh, and his name was Jyoti Rao, Jyoti Rao Fooley. And he'd been attending a, uh, an English missionary school. Savitribai, however, like all girls of India at that time, was not invited to school, a lot like Comenius' experience, excluded from any form of formal learning. So her husband became her guru, and he taught her to read, reading that included the Bible. Together they came to admire one that they called Bali Raja, which means suffering king. The ways and teachings of Bali Raja Jesus renewed their minds in so many ways, on so many topics. They understood marriage and gender, social class, and even food from a different perspective than did their cultural and religious neighbors. Here are some of Fooley's words from his book in which he takes a critical look at the Indian caste system. He says, Bali Raja undertook the task of releasing his poor oppressed brethren from the bondage of slavery and strove to establish the kingdom of God on earth. So though Jyoti Rao, her husband, taught her much, he and Savarchibai were soon working as partners in the work of social reform. Uh, accompanied with great effort and even physical persecution as they presented their bodies as living sacrifices, she herself became known as a leader in her own right. She's, in fact, known as the first native female teacher in India. And by the age of 22, she'd started close to 20 schools for girls from the lower castes. Because of her work as teacher and educational entrepreneur, Savitribai is now known as India's mother of modern education. In her own time, uh, this woman would not be considered a success. But today, there are statues and Google doodles in expression of gratitude for her. One of the things to recognize here is that ideas that reflect the kingdom of light sometimes take time to germinate and grow. Today, the education of any Indian woman anywhere grows says Professor Tom Wolfe, from a garden planted by Savitribai Fooley. Listen to further words from Fooley reflecting this couple's common beliefs. In his book, he says, one great champion of the downtrodden, the holiest of the holy, the great sage and lover of truth, Bali Raja, came into this world and gave of true and holy knowledge and granted everyone an equal right to it. So what happens when this sage wisdom and this beautiful truth of Bali Raja Jesus renews your mind? What happens when your intellect is renewed as a disciple scholar here at APU? What do you walk away having learned as you enter the world to work and to serve? Romans 12 verse 2 says that you will learn to know God's will, what is good and pleasing and perfect. What are you studying? Think about it. Renewing your mind will mean that you learn to know the good will and way of God in the study and practice of, of criminal justice, the way that pleases God in the study and practices for preparing to be a teacher, 
God's more complete way and will in the study and practice of, of the chemical sciences? What are you studying? As you engage in academic work, are you learning to know the good, the pleasing, the more complete will of God? That's our hope. It's called Christ-centered academic excellence. That's what we intend for you. Whether you're focusing history or your focus is on nursing or business, youth ministry, computer science, whether your degree takes you straight into a job or whether it has simply prepared you to be a person of integrity, well-being, intending to be a blessing to others in the world. Each of these four people, through that lens, that Romans chapter 12, verse 2 lens, thought and lived as citizens of the kingdom of light. This made it possible for them to engage the challenges of their world with true knowledge, divine understanding, and godly wisdom. My friends, being at APU is a special opportunity, and this is a very special place, even during these strange and unusual times where we're being forced to carry out our mission still in the unique context in which we are forced to live. But I'm going to tell you that if you commit to being intentional about the work of being transformed by the renewal of your mind, we'll help. That's our vocation. That's our calling as a Christian university. And we want to get doing this with you together in this semester and in the semesters to come. If you'll allow me, I'd like to close our time with a favorite prayer of mine from Scottish theologian John Bailey. This prayer that I'll use to close was written in 1936. Let's pray this together. O thou who art the source and ground of all truth, thou light of lights who hast opened the minds of humankind to discern the things that are, guide me today, I beseech thee, in my hours of reading. Give me grace to choose the right books and to read them in the right way. Give me wisdom to abstain as well as to persevere. Let the Bible have proper place and grant that as I read, I may be alive to the stirrings of thy Holy Spirit in my soul. Amen.